Next year is 50. Jubilee year. Amen. 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 50. And in Jubilee, God begins to restore that which is lost. Praise God. Amen. So I'm agreeing with you all today. Okay? God's word. Not ours. God's word. The Jubilee is coming. Amen. 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 For the restoration. Hallelujah. For the house of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God today. Hallelujah. One of the things I'm going to be referring to a lot today, so I just want to get it all off the table, is Eddie. Praise God. Amen. Only because I couldn't even sit in this seat today unless it was for him. Amen. He was my teacher, and I had the most great and utmost respect for the Christ that was in his life. For Jesus Christ, who spoke through that man's life. And I just honor him because I am able to sit here today because of the teachings and what the Holy Spirit has done in our lives. Amen. Praise God. Amen. 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 So this is um, the community and <clears throat> of the crucified one. And as our as a late pastor, um, Isaac Green, Dr. Isaac Green said, <laughs> right, when he walked up to the steps into the mother house and came into the sanctuary there, he says, if this isn't the community of the crucified ones, whose is it? <laughs> the crucified one. He said, what a name, he said it was. Jesus Christ, who died for all of our sins. What a privilege it is to carry the name of the crucified one. Amen. Amen. What it is a privilege to be his community. This place belongs to the Lord. Amen. Amen. This is his community. Amen. Amen. He has re erected these walls. He's done it all. He started this process long before it was the community of the crucified ones. When we were coming in here renovating it, we we're looking around and seeing a hundred years, over a hundred years, God started his work in this building as a Jewish temple, as a synagogue where men and women of the Jewish faith gave their lives to build this place and to do the work. We never knew when we came into this temple that in this day and hour, the Christian church would be so interested in what has happened and transpired in the history of, of Israel. Because we know, we know that our beginnings start there. Our beginnings start with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We are part of all of that. God puts this thing together, not us, folks. God puts everything together, not us, folks. We are just privileged to be able to be a part of God's plan, amen? And we have been a privilege to be a part of what God's plan is for here. Scripture that I want to read, start with this morning is a scripture that we've been using all year long. And it is from, if you want to get your Bibles out, it's Isaiah 43. Oh, Isaiah 43. 18 and 19. I know, wait a minute, 18. Okay. Remember not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing, now it shall spring forth. Shall you know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and in the rivers and in the desert. Today, I would like to liken what we are doing is not so much as a seminar, but as a retreat before the Lord. And I know that 
that all of you, well, maybe not all of you, but many of you have come in here with preconceived ideas as to what you're going to get or what you want to receive. And that in itself could be a block to what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life today. I don't want you to be looking at me, but I want you to be asking constantly the Holy Spirit in your life today to teach you. Because all through our existence with God, we've always been taught you can take away the buildings. You can take away the people. You can take away your health. But the day that we lose the Holy Spirit is the saddest day that we will ever encounter in our life. Today it is the Holy Spirit who is going to teach you. So pray for this unworthy minister that he would be able to be that vessel that the Holy Spirit might speak into your life today. Because God is about to do something in your life. But if you hang on to what has happened to you in the past, to the events which happened in the past, and you continue to try to, to use them to figure out what's being said to you, you get stymied. You need to come with a fresh anointing, a new anointing upon your life. For this is an hour in which God is doing something new. Praise God. Something new. To him it's not really new. But he's just moving us along. He's saying to us, get in, get in line. The enemy, again, was going to try to bring you into the past. Resist him. Because that's what the word of the Lord says. Resist him that he might flee from you. You are here today to be a student of the living word of God. And the only one that can teach you is the Holy Spirit. And so I ask you the question right now. Do you trust the Holy Spirit today? Amen. Yes. Do you trust him? Tell him. Just close your eyes. And tell him, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. I trust you. I trust you to speak to me today and to give me the direction for my life that is your direction and not mine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, <clears throat> we have already opened up and already said that the church has been really interested in the Hebrew scriptures. Mm -hmm. When we first started out, we didn't know anything about Israel. Mm -hmm. We made a trip back in 1979, and we didn't know much. Well, we were interested in his, the Via Del Rosa and where Jesus walked, but, archaeology and the history and all the importance of that sea, the Dead Sea Scrolls, that was not a thing back then. Today, there isn't a place on TV that you can't find something being talked about of ancient Israel on the Jewish scriptures. Do you think that is the plan of God? Why, certainly it is. Certainly it is. Because God wants to teach you in a deeper, more filling way. When Jesus walked the earth, he walked to speak to the inner man, not the outer man. The inner man, the inner being, the inner person, where the Spirit of God lives within. Today, God wants to speak to your inner man, your inner person. And the fight is always and always will be between the fleshly us 
and the inner us, the inner person within us. There were scrolls that were written back in those days. Uh, they wrote their word on their scrolls. That was the original, as if we could say, the, that was the original Bible. But this is a very important factor to remember. Those were the original text. When Jesus walked the earth, he wasn't speaking to Christians. He was speaking to Jewish people. When Jesus walked the earth, he didn't live in America. He lived in the Middle East. He lived in a Hebrew family. He observed the customs that were written in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament. He followed the feast days and all the things that went in that day and age. All of it recorded in scrolls. By the time we get into the scene, by the time we get here, those scrolls, those ancient writings had to be transcribed. And the first translations were not in English, but they were in Greek. So we study Greek, we even get a little closer to the meanings because those are the first. By the time you get to English, it takes about eight to ten English words to describe one Hebrew word. Now you can imagine then how meanings are lost. And so I always wondered when Eddie used to tell us all the time, if those remember, this book is truthfully recorded but not necessarily the truth. You have to search for the truth, God's word says. God gives you a way that it's recorded, but he teaches you that you must diligently search for the truth, and he is the rewarder of those who search for it. He, the Holy Spirit, is the rewarder. He gives you the inspiration of the word of God. Now we are here today because our title is, our draw is, the end times. We all want to know the end times. But I can say to you today, there is so much material out there today. There are books and books and books the end times has been being talked about since the time of Jesus. He was talking about it. <laughs> and even before he can, the prophets were talking about it. So it is true. There's nothing new under the sun. So if you, you're here today to look for some juicy new hot news item that's going to jump out at you and tell you tomorrow is the day, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> that's not going to happen that way <laughs> because it's not scriptural. Amen. Yeah. Amen today. I put on the board today a couple of plans. The bottom one is called the evangelical dispensation theory. How many of you know that? That's your studies, okay? This is pretty much what Christianity follows, the evangelical dispensation theory. The, the age of law, the age of grace, the rapture, the tribulation, and the white throne judgment. In many seminaries across the land, you don't get your anointing to go forward, your commission to go forward, unless you say that you will stick with this and teach this, okay? That's all I knew. 
And that's all most of you knew when you were growing up in the Lord and studied the Lord. We knew the evangelical dispensation theory. When we came here to study the Word of God and, and do our summaries and stuff, we had that Thompson's Chain reference and stuff like that, and inside of it was the evangelical dispensation theory. And being a teacher, Mark, you being a teacher at the seminary for years, we sat there and the fresh students came in. We went through the same thing over and over again. And that's what we believed, and that's what we lived in. And that's what made us what we were. But today, God is showing us another plan. And I'm not here to say which one is right and which is wrong. I just want to introduce you that there's more. Mm -hmm. And there's more for deeper understanding of God's word. And again, I would say to you that getting towards the end of Eddie's life, and we talked about things, one point when the internet came out, we were able to get into the Vatican Library and pull out writings on the saints, and we talked about those things. And I said to him, well, what teachings would you really like to get into? He said to me, I'd really love to get into the ancient Jewish writings. Well, of course, if he said it, it made me turn around from the, from the library in the Rome and start to look into the Jewish writings. One of the things that I have found is that the Jewish mind does not think like you and I think. Mm -hmm. And their plan of God is different than our plan of God. Even though I study, I'm going to say this right now, I don't plan to go back to be Jewish. <laughs> so if I bring you these things today, don't think I'm trying to make you Jewish. Not that it's not a bad, I'm not, you know what I'm saying? God made us who we are. God made us who we are. We are the church. We are the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. But in the Jewish mind, there is a 7,000 year plan of God. And it begins in eternity past, the garden, they call it. And the first 2,000 years is marked as the years of desolation. When Adam fell, when he was pushed out of the garden, when God removed his presence and the flood came and wiped out the living on the earth, 2,000 years, then Moses appears on the scene, goes to Mount Moriah, and receives the Torah, receives the written word of God, the Ten Commandments. And now the beginning of instruction to God's people. They call that, from 2,000 to 4,000, the instruction years. And in the Messianic, we know that in 4,000 to 6,000, their plan, Jesus came on the earth. They were looking for their Messiah. When Jesus came, what were they asking? Are you the Messiah? And we could talk about the two different Messiahs that they were working with, but we won't because of time today. But Jesus was the Messiah. And that was a period. And then... 6,000 to 7,000 is the future age, is the messianic age. Very shortly, in a few weeks, we will be celebrating again what Feast of the Jews. Hmm? Rosh Hashanah, right? Mm -hmm. The New Year. Mm -hmm. That's when their calendar flips what year are they in right now? 5,999. Mm -hmm. Not 90, is it? No, stuff. So, 5,000, 
seven seven nine they're in now. They're going to go to five thousand seven eighty. Okay, pretty close to six thousand, isn't it? History records that during the time when they are taken out of captivity, there was no records kept. They were in captivity. They were slaves in Babylon and Assyria. And they estimate that was about 240 years. So if you add 240 to 5,780, what do we get? 6,000. We're in the 6,000 to 7,000 here. Okay? Okay? On that scale, we are in the future age. We are in the messianic era. Now, I wrote a bunch of things here that we are not so familiar with as Christians that are in the Bible. Because this Bible gives us a way to discern the times that we are living in. If you remember, Jesus said to us, you can tell the signs of the day. If the sky is red at night, you say what? No, the next day is going to be awesome. <laughs> Sky is red in the morning, sailor take warning. <laughs> you know the signs of the day, the hours that you live it in. But you don't know the signs of God, the times of God. And to us, because we are so focused on, well, there was the age of law when Moses gave the word of God, and we're living now in the age of grace when Jesus came, and we don't even have to go worry about all those things and all the instructions and all that stuff. And what we're doing right now is we're just waiting for the rapture to happen. Because the tribulation's coming. The focus on the 7,000-year plan of God with, with the Jewish mind is deliverance. The focus on the evangelical dispensation theory is the wrath of God, the punishment of God, the chastisement of God. We want to get out. Before that comes, we're all hoping we're going to get out before this doomsday or whatever we see on television over and over again to try to convince us that it's coming, that it's coming, that we got a way out. Within here, it gives you the indications and the times and the seasons of God that we live in. I've written down some of the things that are code words in the Bible for the messianic period. One of them is the day of the Lord. The Lord's day. In that day, at that time, the day of Jezreel, the tribulation period, the time of Jacob's trouble, the birth pangs of the Messiah. Every time that you are reading scripture and you pop up a, one of those things, you take note that time because God has something to say about the period of time that we are living in. He gives us indications in his word. Again, we want to know where we are. We want to know why we are here. We want to know what God wants us to do. We want to make the decisions in our life that will bring us the best result instead of making decisions in our life 
that makes us go around another 40 years. It's all contained in God's word. There are code words running all through that Bible. It's a scarlet thread running through the whole word of God. So one thing that everybody is always interested in is this. Six. On anybody's head here? <laughs> no. <laughs> and most of Christianity, they are worried about taking the mark of the beast. Praise God. <laughs> and we're going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the mark of the beast in this session. In the next session, I'm going to talk about Noah. Because Jesus said, these days, this period of time, will be like the days of Noah. And the final short teaching will be on what is in store for America. I'm going to read to you another scripture now. And that comes from Thessalonians. Find my word out here. Thessalonians 5. <clears throat> oh. I got my fast way to get it. and It's like when you're on the airplane. If you're going to use it, put it on airplane mode. Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 6. First Thessalonians. You got it? <clears throat> this is what the word says. But the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day, the day, the day of the Lord, so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Brethren, be ye not in darkness that the day should overcome you. This is the warning. This is what God's Spirit is telling us. We've moved along. We will see in this Retreat the seminar that we are closer towards the coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord, than we were 4,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago. Because the constant cry is, every generation says, this is the end. Well, we don't know when the end is going to be. We don't. But we can See where we are on the barometer that God gives us. But remember, one day in the Lord is like a thousand years. And a thousand years are like a day in the Lord. And we don't even live a year in the Lord. <laughs> but he warns us and tells us that this is what I want you to know. 
This is what I always want you to have in the back of your mind. Suddenly, without warning, it takes place. Who knew 9-11 was going to take place? We were doing everything as we always do, going along. And suddenly, without warning, the towers come down. Reminding us, reminding us that this is what God is trying to tell us all the time. You got to keep this in the back of your mind. Because God does not want you to be in darkness. In darkness. Let's talk about darkness. What we don't understand is that there are two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of darkness, and there's the kingdom of light. The kingdom of God. Kingdom of heaven. Both of them are operating on this planet called Earth. And the biggest trick of the kingdom of darkness is to get people to think it does not exist. Because it will tell you that you can do more when people don't know you exist than when people do know you exist. Darkness is here, it's been here, and it's growing. And you don't need me to tell you that. Just look at your own city here in Pittsburgh and you see things escalating like we've never seen before. Darkness is growing. When did you ever hear foreign countries in South America give warning to their citizens, don't go to these cities in America, Chicago, Baltimore, Albuquerque. Warnings. When did you ever hear that? There is a kingdom of darkness. There is the kingdom of light. In Thessalonians, he also says to us, don't sleep as others do. So if you're coming to this retreat today, this day, God is reminding you by the power of the Holy Spirit, don't be lulled into sleep. You are here today to wake up. To wake yourself back because the kingdom of darkness puts you to sleep. Puts you to sleep. That's what it does. And it will overtake you as a thief. But you, he says, are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they be drunken and are drunken in the night. For God, drop them down to nine, has not appointed us to wrath. Evangelical, waiting for that wrath, waiting for that to come. But he's appointed us to salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live with him, whether I am dead or alive, I belong to the Lord. When I live or I die, I belong to the Lord. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as I do. We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. Now, I want you to know today, according to God's word, who labors amongst you. Right over there, Father James Bazzelli. Back there, Father James Dudash, Father Leo, 
myself. Who are we? We are the community of the crucified one. We are brought up, trained, ordained through this community. That's who is laboring over you. You don't have your blacks on, so I couldn't say. Father, Chris over here. Okay? Brought up. God brought up through his community that he erected men who will train you in this vision and what God has given you. So, that's what the scripture says. Know who's laboring among I want you to know who's laboring among you. So, everything that's coming out of me today is filtered through what I have been taught here in this community. Even if we look in other books and things like that, it's all filtered through what we were given here. And it always will be the sound teachings that we were given here. So what's happening? That's what God, Paul is saying. Know who is talking to you today. Now, if I all of a sudden was getting convulsions up here out of fear from sitting in the seat or something going on inside of my body, I wouldn't go over to my brother over there. I'd go right there to Jill, who's a doctor. True. Because she has the authority and the knowledge of her field. And I tell you, we have the authority and the knowledge of our field. And the trouble is, in this day and age, people who don't have that think they know more than what God has given. Us in this community, which belongs to him in this vision, in this place which he is speaking to. I am not by any ways telling you that this is the only place to live or to go and to hear from God. I am telling you that God sets places up and sets people in those places that they will be a part of the work that he is doing in that place. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Okay? For it is written... It is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. How be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthly, such are they that are earthly. And as of heavenly, such are they that are heavenly. Paul is telling you, that there are two you. Two of you. There is the earthly man, then there is the spiritual man. And this is where we get so confused all the time. You're never going to change the earthly part of you. When I walked in these doors as a young man, 
My name was Willard. My wife walked in as Kathy. We were earthly, as you can see. When we walked down the steps, we were so earthly, without shoes on and long hair and long hair, he spoke to Buzzy and said, get them out of here. <laughs> the earthly man of Eddie. But then the spiritual man of Eddie said, no. The Lord said they're to stay. Today I'm not Willard. This year I will go to my 50th anniversary of high school and everybody there will call me Willard. <laughs> but I am not Willard. I bear the markings of Willard. I'm always going to be dealing with that old son of a gun. But the greater work that's being done in me is Father Paul. I just came back from mission work. Everywhere I go, throughout the world, even in my own country, I'm known as Father Paul. Who could have done that but Jesus Christ himself? It's not me that lives, but it's him that lives through me. It's not you that live, but it's Christ that lives through you. And this is the conflict that we're undergoing all the time in our life because the fleshly part of ourselves will not let us go because the fleshly part is strong and it's attached to the kingdom of darkness. The kingdom of darkness has influence over your life through your flesh and your mind. But the spiritual man grows through the spirit of the living God. And God wants to teach you how to connect with that spirit, how to walk in that spirit, how to be sharp in that spirit, how to discern in that spirit. Do you want to stay where you are right now? Do you want to walk out of this life satisfied where you are? I've learned I don't. And now I understand what Paul says. Lord, why do you give me this thorn in the flesh? As a constant reminder of the flesh in my life, in our lives. We come to this end time in our life and we are seeing that God wants to do a new thing. He wants to do a new thing in your inner man. He wants to waken you up as the sons and daughters of life have you been called to be. Oh, it is amazing. It blows me away. What God is doing is happening, as Paul said. It's already happening. 1 Corinthians. Earthly and heavenly. As we have borne the image of the earthly, we will bear the image of the heavenly. Because Jesus is that image. And it's he that lives within us. Which image are you bearing most the time when you walk? So people were afraid, I'm going to take that image of the beast. I'm going to take the mark of 666. Well, let's talk about that today. When the last time I went to Israel, I was in an airport, 
and there was a whole mess of Jewish people on my plane, and we were all now in another layover airport. And, and we landed early in the morning, it was dark, and the sun began to come up, and all of a sudden, in their briefcases, in their satchels, they're all whipping out their tefillin. You ever heard of tefillin? It's what they wrap themselves with, with these black boxes on. And as the light is coming in, they're all wrapping the, wrapping and wrapping and doing their things, and they're doing their dobbin, and they're dobbin, and they're dobbin, and dobbin. And of course, you know, here I am, Western mind, thinking, ha, 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 I don't have to do that stuff. <laughs> thank God. Well, thank God, really, I don't have to do it. <laughs> but they're under a different covenant than I am. And they are faithful to what they have been given to do. And in research about the tefillin, they wrap their arm first four times, then they leave two spaces and three more times. And not realizing that the four represents Messiah as a name for Messiah, the numerical value from Messiah. And then the three, the spaces of the constantly reminding them that they are to examine themselves daily. There's a little black box that's on it that they press towards, that goes close to their heart, and they put one on their mind. But the funniest thing about that is I know I'm going to lose you a little bit here, but I'll try to put this up. Okay. Is that on that black box is written a Hebrew letter G. G. Okay. And what is she? means, it means El Shaddai. Mm -hmm. But it is made out of another Hebrew letter, Vav. And these three letters, the miracle value, each is six. So really, Sheen is six, six, six. Every day, they are covering themselves with the numerical letter of 666. Six, six. Oh. <laughs> Maybe our ancestors are right. <laughs> we better get away from them. Do you know who's the greatest counterfeiter there ever was? Satan himself. The God that you serve is the God of creation. He's a creative force. He can create everything. Satan can create nothing. All he can do is duplicate. He duplicates God's system constantly over and over again. Six, six, six. We are told not to take the mark of the beast. And everybody is worrying about taking the mark of the beast. And here, our Hebrew brothers and sisters are marking themselves, or putting that number on them in their letter of Sheen, which represents represents God Almighty El Shaddai. What are they doing? What did we learn from them? They learned how to take a earthly 
thing, right, boss? An earthly thing for a heavenly release. God shows us in his word how to take earthly things for a heavenly release. At the end of this seminar, tomorrow, if you come, we will anoint you with the chrism oil, the elder's oil, for a, which is an earthly thing for a heavenly release in your life. We are constantly being shown by God how to use earthly things for heavenly release in our life. And they work because God blessed it to work that way. Showed us how to work that way. That's what the priest learns how to do. To take the things that are God. We take the oil. We take the incense. We take the water. We take the salt. We take the ashes. All of those things are what God uses to release a heavenly blessing on our lives. Because there is a difference between the kingdom of the earth and the kingdom of Almighty God. There is a separation. And we want to get the blessing that comes out of the kingdom of God. And so the Jew knows and was taught how to take earthly things to release heavenly blessings in their life. So what they were doing really with the tefillin every day, and they tied it real tight around themselves so that everybody would know that when they released that, that they belong to God. That they dedicated their whole life to God every day. That God, in his covenant making with them, they have taken on the name of God. Shin, the name of God. El Shaddai, the name of God. When we take on the name of God, it releases the earthly blessing. We say, do it all in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. But we don't realize we're taking an earthly thing for a heavenly blessing. He walked the earth. He was of the earth. He was flesh. He teaches us how to release the heavenly blessings in our life. Come on, folks. We don't want to just be stumbling around here anymore. We don't want to be a church without power anymore. We want to move as God wants us to move because the kingdom of darkness is growing and God is releasing the information in this hour how to strike back. The whole thing is amazing to me because it's all about the Lord and his bride. <laughs> what do they do at the end of that string? They wrap it around their ring finger. How many of you got something on your ring finger reminding you it's a symbol and a token that you are the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. You think these things just appear out of air? God uses earthly things to release a spiritual blessing on your life. The bride. We're constantly reminded that in the kingdom of God, the concept of God is the groom and the bride. Jesus talks about it over and over again. So in, in our Hebrew brothers in the face when a marriage is being done, the bride is there and the, and, and the groom walks around the bride three times. Promises in her food, Clothing and intimacy. 
and the bride walks around, the bridegroom promising faithfulness to live peacefully and to have fair judgment. And in it we begin to see the release of heavenly blessing. For after the walk, then they face each other and they're face to face. And in the Hebrew, it's called panim. Face to face. The glory of God, makavot, comes in between them to bless this union, which is the same thing that God is trying to do with us, his bride, and the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. The two become one. The tabernacle of God. In our marriage, at the end of it, we say, let no man put asunder what God has joined together. May it's holy union with God. Your life with God is a holy union. Our marriage together is symbolic of the marriage between Christ and his church. The whole plan of God comes down to relationship with man. So if we look at these pictures and these these plans, it's nothing more than God's relationship to us. And it's what God is obligating himself to give to us. He doesn't have to, but he obligating himself in this covenant, in these vows to give to us. So when the man was giving food, clothing, intimacy, he's giving provision to the wife. He's giving provision to his wife. What is God's promise to us that he will provide for us? The kingdom of light is all about the provision of Almighty God for his people. The kingdom of darkness is not God's provision for it. It is you make provision for yourself. There's a difference. In the end times, this is what's growing. People are losing their faith in the kingdom of God and it's providing power over their life. And they are hungry and driving for the system of the world known the beast system to grab and take and build for themselves. In this marriage, he promises you provision. That means God is my provider. God is my provider. It's not providing you when you are good. He provides for you in this covenant all the time. That's why we say God is good all the time and all the time God is good he's a good provider you might not think of it you aren't getting it when you think you should be getting it it's because God knows what's best the kingdom of this world is not based on the provision of God but it's based on buying and selling. Buying and selling. The kingdom of this earth, the system of the earth that's growing is a system of buying and selling. A 
and let's see what it promotes. So we have in the Bible a man named Naaman. You know who he is. Hmm? What happened to Naaman? He got leprosy. This word teaches me why leprosy. This word teaches me that leprosy is a spiritual disease. The kingdom of God is not flesh, it's what? It's spiritual. And if I get a spiritual disease, it is inflicting me, it's, it's keeping me from being able to have the spiritual in my life. And this word teaches me time and time again. This is what he taught the priests, how to recognize the spiritual diseases that were in the people. And the mark that Naaman got was leprosy because Naaman was rich. And the problem with becoming rich is that as you grow in it, pride and arrogancy grows in your life. And the result of it is that God marks you. And you might not be able to see that mark, but you can certainly see the results of it. Marks the forehead. And all around, we can begin to see in this buying and selling world that we live in, in this consumerism that we will, and that that's the way to grow. That's what, you, that's what gives you peace. It doesn't give you any peace or joy. Maybe for a moment. But I'm talking about the lasting joy and peace that God can give you from the kingdom of Almighty God. You need that for the hour that we are walking in right now. But God is going to show you how to have the ability to walk in this darkness as it grows and grows and grows in the earth spurred on by. Hmm. The kingdom of darkness. One of the ways that we recognize it, the word teaches us, the mark of it is, you will see pride, arrogance, and evil speech. What is evil speech? Gossip and rumor. Gossip and rumor. And the only way to get through it is repentance. In Numbers 12, 10 through 11, there was a woman that you all are familiar with. Her name was Miriam. Do you know who she was? Hmm? Hmm? Numbers 12. And a cloud departed from the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked at Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said to Momus, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us wherein we have done foolishly, and here we have sinned. What did she do? She complained and murmured against the man of God, Moses. The evil speech came out of her. 
We have never seen such a time in our own nation where evil is come, speech is coming out against our leaders. It used to be when you took office, you were, everybody got together and you respected it. But evil speech is everywhere. And that leprous condition is happening, folk. And here it is, the analogy that we always use. The word picture. The little frog in the boiling pot. If the pot was boiling, you put it in and you jump out. But it doesn't work that way. He's in there, bloop, 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 bloop. this is great, great, great. And the, water, and the heat keeps turning up and keeps turning up and, and it gets boiled. And that's where we are when we're falling asleep. That's where the church is going. It's falling asleep. It doesn't see the time and the hour that we're living in. Evil speech. Attacking leadership. Never before. Bernadette, where is she? She's a teacher. Well, how old was that little student? Nine, ten year old. Just the other day. Gives her the finger. It was a time in our age, you didn't dare do that because of the repercussions. Bernadette sent it right to the office. But did the, but did the administration do anything? This isn't his name. Johnny, you're having a bad day today. Try to do better, John. Folks, wake up. It's later than you think. The kingdom of darkness is real and it's driving its force into our children. The whole educational system since the last hundred years is driven to bring them into the kingdom of darkness. They can't help it. Their minds are formed and shaped that way. This first, I'll finish with this and we'll take our break. The first corruption that we see in the word of God is Uzziah. He was a good king of Israel. His all around, he was being blessed. He was doing things for the Lord every day. But what happened? The wealth kept coming in. The wealth kept coming in. The prestige kept coming in. He started beginning a Arrogant and proud. And the word says, I mean, he was 50 some years a king. And the word says at the end, he decided he was going to walk into the temple and offer incense on the altar. And right at that moment, he was struck with leprosy because of his arrogance and his pride. And God had to separate him. They had to separate him, even as his king, from the community because of his arrogance and his pride. Because leprosy is contagious. Arrogance and pride is contagious. He would not listen to the priests when they told him, you can't do this. For it is written in the law that this is, is, this is for the priest. I don't need a priest. Pride and arrogance. It 
It's growing, folks. It's growing all around the world. They're beginning to separate those who have under the system of buying and selling those who have not. A mark of that kingdom is being placed on the heads. You might not see it, but God sees it. God knows. We have to wake up. God gives a way out. And the way out is repentance. Miriam repented. She was brought back into the camp. She could come back into the camp. She was clean. She repented. Isaiah would not repent. Before anybody can come back into the kingdom of light with that mark. They've got to repent before God. That's why Jesus begins his ministry and say, repent. John the Baptist before him, repent. Repent. It's so easy for us. It's so easy to sit in the seat and know the word of God and be filled with the knowledge of the word of God and get a puffed head up. Do you know that? Do you know that wherever we are in life, when, when, when excellence begins to take over in life and we're in the groove and, we're think, we, and no one else knows anything but us, do you know that sin is at your door? Do you know the warnings that God gives us? So this mark of 666, this mark of the beast is happening. You're looking for it to be the chip And they've already tried to implant the chip several times and it didn't work. But believe me, my credit card company knows more about me than anybody else. This darn thing knows more about me. Oh, 35 more miles and you'll be in Homestead. I didn't even punch it in, but it knows where I am. I'm not worried about what this, that system has. And neither should you be. Because you already are the opposite of that, Mark. You're a sign. You're a sign in the earth. God has made you his sign. He has made you his covenant. He is, he is your provider. You're not looking towards the world and its ways. You're looking to Jesus Christ. It's he who stands in this room amongst us. It's he that we bow down before. It's he that we get behind. It's his name that must be exalted in our life every day. It's the reason that we're here at this service because we're hungry for God. Hungry for God. And in that hunger, that contract with God, we know that he is our provider. Let's take a break. Let's have our lunch. Jesus, we thank you, and we bless you, and we give you glory. We have no no other place to go, Lord, than you. This is your house. This is the place that you have built for us. This is where you promised that you would meet us and you promised that you would give us your provision. And we are here today as the bride to tell you that we will be faithful to you, Lord. Faithful and that we will study your word so that we can 
constantly make fair judgments, not according to our own intellect, but according to what your word says. And that we will live together peacefully. We will love one another as you've called us to do, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you so much. We don't want to stay where we are. We want a deeper capacity to be able to love you, Lord Jesus. We want to be your sign on the earth, Lord God, of the kingdom of God. Bless us, Lord, we pray. Bless our food and our fellowship in Jesus' name.